um, build an environment of pursuing curiosity. You know who you are, who you really are. Like, <laughs> you are listening to Everyday Educators on 1921 Radio. Everyday Educators, and we educate every day. Welcome, loved ones, back to the Everyday Educators podcast um, here on 1921radio.com and watch it wherever you are in the comfort of your kitchens around the world. I am Jeremy here with the illustrious, the beautiful, the dead battery having (laughs) Miss Palacios Nelson. What's going on there? How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing good. Um, we, we are joined today with one of the, the four horsemen, with uh, Sidney Portier himself. <laughs> Look, that's my joke. We have uh, the great Chris Brooke. You know, I, I, was, I was thinking about it, and I had a name. I was like, we. I think we're with a sip and savor patio posse. Mm, I like that. Hold on, my posse cuts are dope. We're gonna have to do something with that. Um. All right, my audio just kept cutting out, so let's just cut this thing off. Okay, we rolling. And Chris Brooks is a senior project manager for Project <laughs> Management Advisors Incorporated. We're gonna get more into what yeah. exactly. That is, but we just gonna kick it off. Uh, what was the best part of y'all week? What was the best part of y'all week? Whoever mm. want to go first. Um, school drop off. Ah, first day of school drop off worked out very well. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, my oldest is starting kindergarten, so ah, beautiful. You know, nice little change there. So that that was that was a good thing. That was a great thing right there. Oh. Okay. All right. What about you, Nay? That's I had a tough week, so let me think about this. Well, as you think, I'll say the best part of my week uh, is that I started class, started mm. class, and I am on. I have three classes left, and then I start writing my dissertation. So, you know, uh, All right. nearing the end of this of this journey. So that you know, that's that's good. All right, Nate, we back on you. Um, I guess the best part of my week is that we had our, we start having our parent nights in the second week of school. And so it is always good to see parents and connect with parents, especially the new ones that we bring in, um, and check on them, check and see how their kids are doing. And so, um, the ones that I was able to see are really happy. They're thriving. Their kids are thriving. They're enjoying being at a new school. So... That always makes me happy because I feel like sometimes in the admissions process, I I do a little bit of fighting sometimes for, for families that I think are a really good fit or students I think are a really good fit. So it always makes me feel good when I see them on the other side and I can prove that my instincts were right. So. Come on with your instincts. All righty. Um, part of this check-in, trying to get to know one another better, right? Um So if you haven't heard, Brother Kevin Hart uh, hurt himself recently, racing against retired NFL running back, Stephen Ridley. I didn't know it was that. Yes. Mm -hmm. And he tore his abdominal muscles and hip muscles and is now chair bound for uh, six to eight weeks. So quick question. Yes. Are both of these individuals over the age of 40? Yes, they are. Yes. Okay. Yes, they are. Um, um, yeah. <laughs> and so the question is, can you remember a time, may, uh, maybe in recent memory, um, when <laughs> when you realized you were too old for this, when your body didn't go where your heart, you know, was trying to take it? <laughs> oh my God, we were just talking about this at work. But Chris, I will let you go first. I no, 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 no. You're already on it. <laughs> so last school year, we are... Um, head of school decided that we would take the seniors on a hike. It was an opportunity to connect with them, support them, all the things. And so um, we 
wound up taking them on a hike. Now, I am not entirely fit. I never hike. I'm not an outdoor person. And I said, do you think I should go on this? And he said, yeah, you should come. It's a long walk. That, my friends, was not a long walk. Oh, you thought hiking was walking? Lord. <laughs> it was. So then later on, we just talked about this at work yesterday. We looked up the trail. It's called like Hell Trail or some like level of difficulty hard. It was so, and I kept joking. I was like, I can't, like, they're young. Like, they were running and, like, they were having the time of their lives. And I was like, I'm I'm too old. I'm too old to be experimenting and doing new stuff. I don't hike. I'm not hiking. That's it. <laughs> like, I'm never doing that again. <sighs> so, that's my story of <laughs> doing something I shouldn't have been because I was too old. Wow. What about you, Chris? Um, it involved hiking. This was something a lot more pedestrian as over at the park. And it was a birthday party going on. And I mean, it was, I don't know, it was something where it was a lot of families over there. So the kids are together, dads, moms, everybody's gathered together over here at the park. And, you know, when you're having a good time and basically when adults get around each other, they start talking to adults like, oh my gosh, I can talk to someone who is not a child. I'm going to take advantage <laughs> of this. Oh, Quite a feeling. Let, me, let, me, let me interact with another, with another <laughs> grown person. And you're getting into it. And then there were a couple kids who, including one of my own, who took the initiative to just break out and go way on the other side of the, of the baseball fields towards the street. So they were in like Dora the Explorer mode so I'm like, okay, is it time for me to be super dad? So I break out into the Carl Lewis run, like Ricky beating my chest, kicking, like this just, just hard full hard. kick, just, just going, 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 going. And I'm just going hard. And I had this moment where it's just like, oh, snap. I haven't run like this in a long time. <laughs> Man, this feels good. I'm flowing. And I got, I'm like, okay, let me calculate my stamina. I'm going to make it before I pass out. But then my hamstring just goes, yoink. <laughs> and I'm just like, whoa, like just like stuck in midair. And like, oh, hold on. And, but I have, you know, all the families and the moms, you know, looking at me, you know, like, okay. So I'm just like trying to play it off and I'm not, you know, hop along a little bit. Let me try and keep this dry. But I go over and get the kids. But as I'm walking back and for the next four days thereafter, mm -hmm. yeah. I am reminded that um, it's not something that you can't do it, but you don't do this. Mm -hmm. The days of just let me just get up and go do something are over. You need prep. You got to prep. Yeah. You need stretch. You need cool down you need warm up you need no. epsom you need salt you need all that stuff all of it all of it <laughs> i've learned to appreciate the after workout stretch like you got to stretch twice yes um yes. <laughs> i remember um a few years ago i was on a date and we went skating and i fell once on both knees so i fell once on my right knee the next time I fell, I fell on the left knee trying to keep it cute. Mm. Like I knew I was going down, but I just like, boom, hit the ground, try to bounce back up. Yo, like you said, the, the following week, <laughs> it was like someone was still punching me in my knee. It was, yeah. So, um, wishing Brother Hart a smooth and quick recovery. Amen. Um, but I do think this is an opportunity for him and Lil Duval to go like on a wheelchair tour since they were both like wheelchair bound yes. recently. That would be kind of dope. Brothers and wheels. Um, now we're going to go to this week's actual factual. We have two stories today um, coming both from the Grio. Um, the first one, we're going to the Bay Area. Now, when I was writing this up, like I thought about having like my hyphy moment, but I'm gonna keep it. I'm gonna keep it cute. Um, Oakland, California, where there is a new housing initiative to keep black male teachers in the in the Oakland school district, um, and this comes by way of a partnership between Riaz Capital and Urban Academy. Riaz Capital is a Bay Area real estate developer. And this partnership is in response to a teacher strike in May 
um, where educators brought forth several issues, including housing and transportation. Although the article did not go into detail as to why they're targeting black male teachers, um, they said for this first um, phase of the project, they'll be providing, providing um, subsidized housing for about 10 teachers. Um, mm -hmm. But black male teachers only make up 1% of the teacher population in California. So a win is a win. Um, and so I appreciated how this article kind of reflect on like how industries can partner with educational institutions to provide like new solutions, you know? Um, and my question to you guys is, have you had any black male teachers and can you kind of speak to their importance or their impact on your educational journey? I have had black male teachers. Okay. Now, the sad part, I'm probably going to click them off on one hand, but, uh, you know, Mr. Howard, Mr. Gettings, who wasn't one of my teachers, but was an administrator, and um, Mr. Mims. Wow. Okay. But, and I'll say this, physical education. Oh, classes, yes. Well, we hold it down. Mostly had we hold, we hold Black down. men um, with a few, you know, with a couple of uh, hardy white women in there, too, you know, um, shouts out to them. Um, but it was still a thing where I think to find a male teacher is a dynamic in itself because the prototypical pop culture version of a teacher is uh, usually female. So to find uh, a male and then a black male, it's almost like a, uh, a double diamond in the rough. So, you know, but I do remember very clearly um, probably the most impactful situations were the black male teachers because it was as if they were to speak something to me that I can tell um, was very focused and it cut through any sense of bias, kind of like, hey, I know you and what I'm telling you is for real deal. So this is what it is. Like, for example, I can never forget my high school um, CPS student ID number. Not, well, not my high school number, but just my CPS ID number. I didn't know it. I didn't care. It was on every report card, every marking period. But all it took was Mr. Marshall to be like, hey, stop me in the hallway. What's your student ID number? I don't know. I'm like a 12-year-old freshman at Lane Tech. And... He just like, you need to know this number. And he read it off and he made me repeat it. And for some reason, he felt like it was necessary for me to know that. And I never forgot it. And uh, yeah, it it's just, it's something about it where it's the things they say just click. And I'll leave it at that. All right. I feel like having a black male teacher is the equivalent of finding a holographic Charizard card. Like, you got it. <laughs> it's like, wow. This is this is valuable. I don't know what to, quite what to do with it. And then years later, it's like worth thousands of dollars. You're like, see, I needed that. I need to hold that down. Mm -hmm. What about you, Nay? I have been lucky enough to have a number of black male teachers. Um, but I will share that my mother was very strategic in where I went to school and where I spent my time. And so everybody she like create which in chicago i feel like wasn't that difficult but like she created this like little cocoon of blackness because her philosophy was that there i like you have your whole life to deal with what the world will give you but i only have a finite amount of time to to make sure that you are comfortable in your own skin and you have the opportunity to be around people that look like you. And so imagery is important to her. That's it is now important to me. And so I had a, um, Mr. Rayburn was a, a teacher assistant at my charter school. Um, I had another math teacher that was like, I can't remember his name. Mr. Harris was our theater teacher. Um, I played the violin for 12 years, nine of those years, my private mm -hmm. lessons 
was a black man, Mr. Howard. And so I just feel really lucky to have had um, those experiences pretty much my whole life. That's good. Um, <clears throat> I have not had as many as <laughs> um, I would have liked to now that I reflect on it. But one brother in particular, um, and I ran into him not too long ago at the coffee shop, um, Mr. Davis. Mr. Davis was our computer science teacher. And he came in after we built a computer science lab. So we had a brand new lab and we brought in this at, at, I mean, I'm taller than him now, but this giant black man with these long drag lots. He looked like something between Michael Jamal Warner and like the Predator. Like, <laughs> but, but he was <laughs> that's a weird combination but you know Malcolm Eddy the show was out at the time so he was and he wasn't a gym teacher right because we had Mr. Jackson Mr. Potts we had you know gym teachers who were black but you know this guy was a computer science teacher and yeah. he was like just so cool so cool because I was in fifth grade he started dating the fifth grade teacher They've been married for like twenty. Oh, okay. Years. All right, it worked out. Okay. Yeah, yeah, they still together. <laughs> but when they started dating, we was like, oh. and it was like our, it was like the collective relationship. Like we were all in, <laughs> invested in in their success, and it was and it was the. They always talks about like that moment when you realize like teachers are people, and they don't just like live in the mm. school. And cause, you know she was hard on us, and I guess they had a date and it went well. And she came the next day and she was like super sweet, and we was like, "Nah, <laughs> you two, hey, hey, well, <laughs> okay." Also, oh, y'all, y'all talk outside of this place. Um, and I think that <clears throat> one, you know, me being in education now, I can attribute some of that, you know, to him, but also just the. Uh, kind of utility of the knowledge that he presented like it was just like hey computers are part of your life we're gonna learn this so that whatever you do you're going to use this to do something else and i was like mm -hmm. oh, very very uh tangible so good wait uh, wait actually jeremy this yeah. is you, you, you triggered a core memory right there <laughs> go for it so uh one of my teachers i think her name was miss bauman um elementary school I was in, I spent a summer, maybe like 89, 90, and I was in Jersey. And we went to What New part York. of Jersey? Um, we were, I was in uh, Plainfield. Okay. But in Jersey, all you got to do is cross the street, go to the mm -hmm. AMP, you end up in a whole other city, you know? True, true, um, true, true. But we go to the UN, and on this tour of the UN, I see this teacher and my grandmother's just, and I like tell my grandma like, Hey, that's my teacher from school. And she's like, Oh, let's go talk to her. And I'm just like, no, you know, because <laughs> I'm like, mm -mm, like, no, 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 no. The way she holds it down, this is not what we're going to do, <laughs> but we go over there and she was so sweet and nice wow. and accommodating. And my grandmother was just like, she's a lovely woman. Why were you acting that way? And but then oh we came oh. back to school. I made the mistake of stepping to her like, oh, hey, like, like y'all was in Jersey. <laughs> yeah, for real. Like, like, like she was Blanche, and and I was, you know, one of the other Golden Girls. I came up just like, hey, remember the UN? Hey, how you doing? And she looked at me like I just had like you know three ears on my forehead. Like she was just like, huh? What? And I recognize as an adult now. She, she had to keep a persona. And there is when you're outside the classroom, especially I recognize when teachers are on summer break, they get to live a whole different life. But when you are in between those Labor Day and end last day of school guardrails, you got to have your game face on. So that so she hit me with her game face for certain. Man. <laughs> Sorry, you had the experience. <laughs> oh, look, look, as a kid, like it was it was super confusing, but as an adult, I get it. 
So, hey, look, no, yeah. no problem, okay? Yeah. Um, but shout out to all the black male teachers out there. Absolutely I'm appreciative of you guys. Um, so our second story comes from someone who is not a teacher but plays one on TV. Brother Tyler James Williams from Everyone Is Hate Chris oh, Elementary. Yes. Chris, you watch Abbott Elementary? Yes, I do. I mean, I'm not caught up, but I'm I'm familiar with everything and yeah. all. Yes. So it took Nay to be persistent to make me watch that show. Um, because I was hating. I, I love The Office, and they take a lot of beats from The Office, especially season one. Uh, so I, I had to take some time to just appreciate it for what it is. But um, they do important work and kind of tell a story, a perspective that, you know, doesn't have enough light shined on it, which is kind of what uh, this article is about. So Jared Alexander from The Grill writes on how Tyler James has launched a storytelling series in partnership with W.K. Kellogg Foundation to share stories of educators working in early childhood education. And, you know, we're going to shout out to all the pre-K teachers out there. Um, and this project is called Every Child Thrives. Um, it was launched at Essence Fest this year. And if you are looking for more information, you can visit everychildthrives.com. Um, which made me want to ask, Nay, I know your mom has worked in this space for years. Can you just kind of speak to the importance of her work, uh, you know, from your vantage point, you know, her being a pre-K teacher? Um. I think she always talks about how kids can do more. You just have to be like patient with them. So for example, like her programs, they memorize like four or five poems, but she starts working on those poems now. So she's like, you know, they have to, like it has to be like ingrained in them by the time December comes and they do their program. But I think overall, like they, Pre-K is a big deal for all parties involved. And so I, when I, at one point we were coworkers. And so to be able to go from being a kid that had a mom as a teacher, which I did not like, um, to being two adults in a professional setting and being like, wow, this is amazing. And even as a kid, I, I liked to watch her work. I didn't like that she was a teacher because that impacted my schooling i always feel like ed parents that work in education are a little bit harder on their children and i definitely felt that um but i i always like watching her work because she she's just like great and like she just like floats around the classroom and she just really like loves teaching kids and i remember she even had an opportunity to be an administrator and she was like yeah i'm not doing it like i'm gonna stay and nobody wants to deal with that um, and so to answer your question in a more direct way, I think for preschool, especially if that is your first child, um, it's tough to turn your child over to people that you don't necessarily know, or you've gotten to know as best as you can. Um, and it's hard for little ones, like you're getting up at a certain time every day early and like you are at school all day. Some kids do aftercare. And so like you don't see your parent again until like 530 or six o'clock. And so I think she really keeps that at the forefront of her mind, the care for both the student and the parent in this process. But also mm -hmm. like she's serious about teaching young black kids and like I got to make sure that I can pour all that I can into them and get them prepared as they go on this educational journey. Yes. I have not spent as much time with uh, Mother Tiombe, but um, I know her daughter really well. And, and I say that because as being in education, and I've worked in, from preschools to college, I work with every grade level, and I know like what it takes, what it looks like at the beginning to get the results at the end. And so she's done a phenomenal job, even a little bit of time that I spent um, in and around her classroom. Um, Chris, I would like for you to speak from a different vantage point. I know you have some little ones. And can you just kind of share of your process of what it took to get them into preschool? Because I know that's a story. A story. Yeah. 
No, well, um, I'll put it this way. From the parent's perspective, from my perspective, it is how do we get our kid into selective enrollment, right? Mm -hmm. That's like that's like the new metric. Um, you're either going to just pay private all the way throughout on and forever, or it's like, what do we have to do and invest in right now to, um, to be able to have our child there? So, um, you know, from a preschool perspective, you know, without, you know, throwing shade or salt on them too much, it's, you know, you, you go after like, where's the our kind of people preschool? essentially, right? So you're going there, you're figuring out what are the politics, you are going on your tour, you know, dang near still carrying the child in utero, just so that you could be able to get on the list as fast as possible. But, um, you know, the, the, you know, through the pandemic, or, you know, going into the pandemic, it was like, okay, we just was able to connect and get part of a preschool pod. So literally we just went to the family and um, half a day and either at our house for a week or at the family's house for a week, it was just a way to get started there. Um, and then as soon as uh, IDPH and whoever else, you know, decided to allow the, uh, you know, uh, uh, preschools to open up for in-person, um, we were able to be referred to a place not too far from us. But what I learned was what I thought was, hey, if I'm paying this dough, I'm going to drop this boy off and you all are going to mold and shape him and give him back to me a little genius. I was like, no, this is a partnership. And what I realized from the even from the interview, it's like, OK, are these parents that are going to give a dang and really actually put in the work? And the thing that we found was that y'all doing worksheets at school and we got stuff we're going to do at home. It's creating a full 360 degree environment of education being a good thing. You know, not necessarily trying to make it where, you know, you can't eat unless you spell these five spelling words. You know, it's not like that, but it's just like, you know, we're going to spend some time doing this, doing that. We're going to go out in nature. We're going to learn about science and identifying curiosities and just feeding those curiosities. So um, preschool worked out well. We did pre-K more of a uh, kind of more chill, so to speak, um, more kind of play-based pre-K just so that there could be some socialization. And instead of being all around like a type A environment, let's let you be around some gardens, do some art, you know, do a little bit more things and then we'll do the work stuff at home. So that, you know, all in all, it worked out well. Um, but the big thing was that it is not a, you know, just pay, drop them off and they'll come back ready. But we as parents had to be educated as to what our role was in this. And as soon as we kind of took it on and we were committed because it's like the goal is we need to get him into this particular school. So, um, but I think that where there's a gap is that it's very easy to go to like Chicago school options.org, which is basically like a parent driven listserv. And you can just go fall into an anxiety rabbit hole where everyone's kind of freaking you out about, oh, well, uh, 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 what's the um, what's the percentile that my child needs to get into to get into this school? And, you know, it's like that's that's a rabbit hole there. But I think that a little bit of clarity and dispelling of the myths, you know, do I have to buy the principal, you know, scones once a week for a month? And is there principal privilege? Is there sibling privilege? You know, it's just all these things that we kind of fascinate ourselves with. But, um, you know, I, I've enjoyed my son's experience in preschool and pre-K and now starting kindergarten. And his little brother is following right behind him. So now the key thing is, all right, this is a different kid here. Mm -hmm. So there's going to be some things he's going to be much better at and some things he's not going to be better at. 
and it's participating. But I'll say this, um, for three years old um, in this preschool, they were like, hey, we're giving these kids spelling tests. Why? Because I think parents be like, if my kid isn't doing this and this, then they're not going to be ready, you know? So you're keeping up with perception. But my wife and I were just like, yo, this kid is three. We're going to hit him with a spelling test. But you know what? My wife was working with him. The school was working with him. And he got five out of five, literally writing out five words. So to what you were saying earlier, like at three, I was just about G.I. Joe, He-Ra, he, He-Man, She-Ra, you know, let me build these Legos. But now it's like, if you raise the expectation, they might actually meet it and they might actually exceed it. So like sight words, reading, all your numbers, and you can actually identify and read words and write them out. So, okay, let's just kind of keep feeding and giving and just, you know, see what happens. Everyone might be surprised. Well, um, I thank you for sharing that. I know uh, you hit on something that we talk a lot about um, offline and that's education literacy, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, teachers, administrators, um, and especially parents don't know all of the, they don't know how to maneuver through the system. Like they know, like, oh, preschool. They know the grades, they know the succession, you know, they know what the outcomes look like, but not necessarily all of the inputs. Mm -hmm. And uh, I am glad that you spoke to like your role as a parent, you know? I tell my friends like, you know, who have children, whatever grade your kid is in, that's what grade you're in. Yes. You have multiple children, you're in multiple grades. Absolutely. Um, because you, you know, you are an active part of that, of that learning culture, right? Um, and so <clears throat> thank you for that. Let's talk about um, let's talk about your learning culture. Go back to the roots of Brother Brooks on the north side of Chicago. Um, let's see here. I see you went to Abraham Lincoln Elementary. Yes, indeed. Uh, can you just kind of talk a little bit about your time at Abraham Lincoln? Uh, sure. Yeah, from um, eighty-five to ninety-three. Dang. All right, in the nineteen hundreds. <laughs> For real, you know, she was second grade here at Washington, man. Um, yeah, so um, I guess a little bit before that, like, you know, we, I lived over on 51st and Ingleside as an infant or a toddler. And, well, probably an infant. And because uh, my dad, he was at the post office over on um, 46th and uh, Cottage Grove over at, at that station. And uh, so he's like, hey, this is close. You know, he, he is south side, all that. My mom was like, nah, uh -uh, I ain't doing this. So we moved to the north side, to Old Town. And we just happened to be on the side of North Avenue that was in the boundary for Abraham Lincoln. So, you know, it ended up being, um, in hindsight, experiencing a school with a strong PTA. Um, a lot of professional families and where fundraising, you know, was achievable. We had, you know, the serendipity days and um, things for us was just like, oh, this is cool stuff to do. But really all of this was about raising money and supplementing through the PTA, you know, what the school wants to do. Um, like we had a teacher, um, I won't say his name now because I think he, he got locked up on some weird stuff, but Whoa. he wanted to get a, uh, a, a T1 Quark synthesizer. So this is like 88 and this $5,000 synthesizer and the PTA raised the money and they got it, you know? So it showed like, okay, when you get parents mobilized and active, that that's a differentiator from the school. You know, it's yeah. not necessarily like, hey, we need we need the board to kick down more funds. But 
looking back at it, if we needed something, the parents raised the money and then we got it. So trips, different things, whatever. But it, it turns out that it was, um, I don't know if my parents were that strategic about it, probably not, but accidentally it was a, like very much a top elementary school. Mm-hmm. So um, yeah, so it, it was a good experience. Um, it was racially, it was interesting because you have the, you know, like I had classmates where their parents were attorneys and anesthesiologists and you, some, sometimes the metric for success was social success was, did you get invited to such and so's, you know, bar mitzvah, um, or not, you know, and, um, and then you had people who were bussed in from other parts of the city, you know, so it was this interesting dynamic there. But, um, you know, I love the school. And frankly, I just love being able to be somewhere where I can walk. I mean, it was a bit of a haul, but it was just like walking. And where I lived, you had Marshall Field Gardens, Cabrini a little bit further over. You had uh, another kind of like housing development over on Orchard. And then you have all of Lincoln Park. So you had this weird socioeconomic gumbo going on there. So you just saw a lot of, you saw a lot of what was going on, but it was also this interesting thing of feeling as if you were other in your own community, you know, depending on, you know, what side of the street you were on. Mm. So, yeah, but, um, you know, that, that did well, but growing up in that area, I was very well attuned into architecture. You know, okay. it's like a, a lot of the revitalization of uh, that happened in the 50s and 60s in Old Town resulted in like a lot of modernist homes and and uh, buildings being built, churches, literally just like the fingerprints of certain architects all through that area. So for high school, I'm like, I can go to Lincoln Park with everybody else. Yeah, I just want you to know you're really good at these transitions. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Just roll right. In. I didn't have to ask. Go ahead, brother. You lead the way. <laughs> um, so it's like, you know, choosing a high school. I was like, well, uh, I think I want to be an architect. So um, the high school fa- fair in fall of 1992 was at Lane Tech High School. So I went up there and I just happened to see like, oh, you guys have architecture. Okay. I'm applying here done. And, um, you know, it worked out. I, it, now, they weren't testing people back then, okay? I, I don't think moms was being tested to get into Lane Tech. I know I didn't take a test. Um, my score, my, like my Iowa basic skills test scores were great, but my grades... Iowa were basic skills! <laughs> exactly. Come on. <laughs> ITB, so, ITB, ITBS. We yes. had a whole song and everything. Come on. Oh, uh, so yeah. So, I mean, like, I, I used to do very well in those, but um, I didn't do homework. So, my grades were terrible. So, you know, it was just like, okay, uh, I'm into Lane. I'm here. You know, let, let's get it. Um, interesting tangent. I had an opportunity to go to, to Latin school in Chicago, mm-hmm. like, full scholarship, some altruistic, you know, well-meaning uh, family was uh, going willing to pay for a uh, promising uh, young black child to have an education at Latin. But there were like, and I, I even took the test. I scored right. the highest on the Latin entrance exam from anyone from my school. Yeah, I had the worst on- grades. I'm sorry. What did you say, Naomi? I say, yeah, flex on them. Let the oh yeah, know. exactly. You were exactly. the golden Negro. Look at you. Yeah, but I didn't have the grades. Uh-huh. So they were like, go go to high school somewhere else and then you can come back. But after going to Lane, you know, I was I was good, you know, like it was that was my speed. And, you know, I probably would have had more socioeconomic trauma from, you know, not being able to go on, you know, ski trips with my classmates if I was that Latin anyway. You know, and you know, so there's just a lot of issues there. But um, yeah, so, you know, Lane was good, um, took drafting and, you know, I, I just had a great time. You know, that was my first time actually uh, seeing uh, Filipino people. 
And uh, it because you know, Chicago, if you don't get out certain neighborhoods, you don't see yeah. too many things. But um, it was like being at the UN. So culturally, uh, racially, it was reasons for me to like meet people like, oh, let me take the red line north and let me see what's going on. Let me get off at Greenleaf and experience other parts of the city. Mm -hmm. um, okay, man, y'all folks from the west side. I don't go to the west side. I want to see what Madison and Pulaski is all about. I didn't do it then. I didn't went as an adult. Okay, you know, I I, I, I had limitations. <laughs> That's what you just want to be adventuring to. Right. But but it was a thing where I got a chance to learn more people from across the city, um, and you know, I, I enjoyed high school. You know, uh, mm -hmm. still keep in touch with people from there, as most most high school people do. Um, but yeah, you know, it, it was it, it was a good experience. Um, you know. So uh, we're gonna fast forward a bit. Yeah. Much like myself, uh, well, both of us, you went to an HBCU. Oh yes. You know, Tuskegee University mm -hmm. in the nineteen hundreds. Um, I don't have any Tuskegee paraphernalia. I'm, I'm, I'm surprised. Slacking. I'm, I'm surprised. slacking. I'm supposed to have the banner up behind me and, you know, Booker T, Booker T lifting Lisa. the veil of ignorance from over my hey. head. <laughs> well, Lisa, a, a airman jacket, something. You know. Not the veil of ignorance. <laughs> I told you, Look. his brother is Sidney Portier, okay? He had the cultural grit that I just greatly appreciate. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. So my question, right? Um, because we're gonna get into you going from architecture to project management, oh, yeah. project mm -hmm. management company, and project management inc. <laughs> but, um, how did going to an HBCU kind of impact you in grad school and the workplace? Like, just kind of what kind of impact did that education um, have on you? Like you said, lifted that veil of ignorance. Um, it was important to me. Now, and I had spent summers in the South. So going to the South was something I was familiar with, whether it was Mississippi, um, Virginia, because we're both Virginia is the South, uh, but in time in Alabama and in, in Birmingham area. So I, A, I wanted to get, get away from Chicago and Tuskegee had architecture. I applied to one school, got into one school. And um, I loved it because it was a place to get away from the constraints of how I identified myself as a black male teenager in Chicago, living in Old Town, right? And able to get away and remove some of that and basically just kind of be able to be in a culture, if you so choose, to excel and to achieve amongst your own people and um, removing much of the racial constraints of how do I act around these people or those people. And then you're just more so figuring out how to just act around each other and yourselves and the education, identity, the sense of self, the sense of self-identity, of awareness, and of culture was something that I got there. So I not only was able to, um, you know, kind of pursue academics, but it's to kind of be able to tie in closer to, you know, who I am as an African American and also tie into what happened before me at that, at that school. Mm. Why, why did Dr. Booker T. Washington go to Hampton, get educated, be given a slug of money from Colonel Samuel Armstrong from Hampton and others to be able to go buy this hundred acres or so of land in Tuskegee, Alabama and create a school. And looking at the educators, even going into the cemetery, I did this, not because I'm a weirdo, but because I had like a little like design project that I did for myself. But 
um, I go and I'm looking at the headstones and I'm seeing like, okay, Booker T, he had, you know, he ran through a few wives and they're all buried here. And here's this person. Here is like James Weldon Johnson, I think. Don't quote me on that, but it was like the father of gospel music mm -hmm. and this president, that president, these different people looking at the names on the buildings and understanding that there was a mission strong enough where there were many people who dedicated their purpose for their lives, their resources, their money to keep this going. And it was just a thing where it was just like, hey, I'm here for a lot more than just, you know, going on the yard and, you know, trying to see who crossed Kappa, who crossed whatever. But it's like we are actually here carrying on a legacy. So, you know, that's that's what I carried and, and took from that. So mm. did the HBCU thing. Um, but because we are in America, I made sure to go to a PWI for grad school. Mm -hmm. uh, the thing that I found was that um, as much as I love Tuskegee and value Tuskegee, the manager at my first internship was just like, look, man, the only reason why you got here is because somebody else vouched for you. When I saw Tuskegee, I didn't know what in the heck Tuskegee was. I know U of I. I know U of I graduates. I don't know Tuskegee graduates. So if it wasn't for him speaking up, I would have thrown your resume in the trash. So it was a hard truth, but I appreciated him for stepping up to me the way that he did. Um, so, and this was all about grad school. So he's like, go to a grad school with the name. So um, I ended up going to University of Virginia for one year. And actually this t-shirt right here, 1972 Department of Architecture. This was the year that you had the first black graduate of the School of Architecture at University of Virginia. So Come that on. lets you know right there, timing wise, the difference from what we were dealing with from Tuskegee yeah. going mm -hmm. to UK, you know. Hmm. Architecture graduate and Dolomite all in the same year. That's, that's, <laughs> that's amazing, okay. Um, looking at the clock here. Yeah. And, um, but I do want to kind of hit on a, a few things while we're here, right? Um, quick hits. Quick hitters. So what made you switch? You're doing architecture and now oh, you're easy. project manager. Like what? Um, what was that so the, the way it happened, I worked as an architect for a couple of years here in Chicago. I was living in my uncle's attic in Beverly and just saving every other paycheck for grad school. So two years I did that, I go to grad school, and then I end up working on this project where we're building a house. We're literally building a modular house inside of an airfield uh, hangar, and we're gonna go and, and build it. And I basically learned that, I learned how to draw, but I didn't know how to build a thing. I knew nothing, okay? I worked on drawings for a high rise downtown and McCormick Place and Midway Airport, but I knew how to draw stuff, but I didn't know how things got built. So we're doing this construction project and I'm just like, you know what? I'm learning a whole lot here than I did working in a firm. So let me go into construction. Um, so I graduated, I went into construction and I did that for like eight years. And one of the things that I found was that as much as I enjoyed design, I enjoyed control most of all. And you know what runs the show? Money. So the contractor's budget and managing budget and deliver a building for a cost showed me that it's about managing the money and getting what the client wants for the for what they want to pay for it. But I also observed that there were people who were like project managers or people who worked with the owner and they managed the contractor, the architect, everything else. And they just understood and knew the greater vision of what was going on. So I aspire to get to that point. And after eight years of working in construction, have the opportunity mm -hmm. to go into project management. And um, I've been doing project management probably since 2014. Okay. So that's coming on seven and a half years. Yeah. Yeah. All righty. So to land this plane. Yeah. Somewhere there's a, a young man, maybe at Lane Tech. 
mm-hmm. um, who's interested in architecture. Yes. But realizes he is more interested in having control. He can't build none either. So how can this young man and the educators who pour into this young man, how can they best prepare him today to be the Chris Brooks of tomorrow? What can he do today? Uh, Build an environment of pursuing curiosity. I'm only good at what I do now because I've done a lot of different things. Mm-hmm. And um, in order for me to, to plan something, I have to know what it takes to do what you do. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's mm-hmm. like, hey, uh, spend some time shadowing someone who does this thing. Mm-hmm. And, who, who do, and who do they do that thing with? Shadow yeah. that person. You know, it's just just be curious um, know that you don't know anything and that's quite okay. Um, but just be willing to try a lot of different things and, um, you know, be willing to take a chance, be willing to work hard, be willing to maybe do more than you typically would and do be willing to do something, not always for a check Mm. because the experience is going to be the thing that will fertilize what you might do five, 10 years later. Um, but it, it may, it's not always about the compensation right then and there. Um, but just be, just be eager, be curious, and don't be afraid to fail. Mm, you know what? That sounds like the quote of the show. <laughs> be eager, be curious, and don't be afraid to fail. Um, last question. Last question. There's some things that we didn't get to that we didn't get to today, but that's good. We can talk about it next time you're on the show. Um is there a book? Is there one book that that like has impacted you greatly? A book that you would recommend for maybe this young man or just anybody out there listening to read. Mm-hmm. Give us one book. Oh my goodness. Um Man, this is going to sound trifling, but actually, I think that a book that helped me the most was actually, um, oh my gosh, it was a John Grisham book. No, 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 sorry. Um, oh, I'm, forgive me while I'm looking, but this is uh, Stephen L. Carter. Okay. was the author and the book is called come on show me your books man oh here we go <laughs> the emperor of ocean park the All emperor right. of ocean park yeah you so, google it on, on your own because yeah exactly you gotta google on your own but the emperor of ocean park um chris i want to thank you brother i want to thank you uh, for thank you um just have an opportunity to get to know you uh, beautiful presence um, and you are doing some amazing things I know you talked a lot about what you do at work but I know you have um, your own ideas and visions on how to transform our city in um, the world that we live in and so maybe next time we can talk a little more about that yes, um, indeed. so again this is Everyday Educators where we educate every day you take the opportunity to learn from one of our community educators here Brother Brooks I am Jeremy this is our host Naomi. Um, and you can catch us every week here on 1921radio.com. Um, you can catch us on Instagram at Everyday Educators, spill that at Educate Every Day. And if you have any questions or you might want to be on your show yourself, you can reach out to us at info at educateeveryday.com. Until next time, loved one, peace. <laughs>